You're listening to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast from Clear Creek Community Church. To hear more, check out clearcreekresources.org. All right, welcome to the Clear Creek Resources Podcast. My name is Tiffany Havaducci. I am your host for today. And we have been working through the um, Real Faith Sermon Series. This is kind of a behind-the-scenes look. I'm very excited about this week because you all have a very robust uh, text. So if you feel like you're going to be interrogated, good. That's what I'm going for. (laughs) All right. All right. No, just kidding. But I am sitting here with Brian Leighton and Lance Lawson, and we're going to talk today about James 2, 14 through 26. So would you do the honors of reading it for us? Yeah. James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Mm -mm -mm. That's good. Okay, so there's a lot in there. So let's start first with just the main idea. If people took one idea from your message, what would you hope that that would be from this text? Uh, I mean, what's always helpful about the ESV little notes in there says at the top, faith without works is dead. So, I mean, that's the the main point. Uh, Mm -hmm. The main point of the the message, uh, as I'm as I preached it, is, uh, you know, real faith makes a real difference that you can really see. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it really shows up in your life. I don't know, what, what was your uh, same, main point? Same thing, same point? Okay. yeah, so uh, just, I, I appreciate the way you distilled that, yeah. um, <laughs> and so I used it, yeah. Real All faith right. makes a real difference that you can really see. I love that. That's like something I can put on my refrigerator, you there know, you make a good yeah. magnet. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's move on to biblical theology. So looking at the overarching story of the Bible, um, the redemption story, did you see anything from this uh, section of your text that you have here that kind of coincides with that? Any themes you want to point out or, or anything to highlight there? Yeah, what do you got? I mean, Lance is a is a big lover of biblical theology. I am. So, yeah. I mean, I love I always love what Lance has to pull out of things like this. So, perfect. Yeah. So, you know, the gospel is more than just Jesus lived and died, and if you believe in Him, you get a ticket to heaven. It is framed in the story of Israel, and mm-hmm. and the New Testament authors are always going back to the story of Israel. Jesus Himself is quoting all kinds of Old Testament passages and Psalms, and so um, to understand what Jesus really did and then what his people are called to do and how they're called to live. It's so helpful to know the story of Israel because Mm -hmm. it's the the whole thing's framed there. So in this case, James, as we just read, calls back to Abraham Mm -hmm. and to Rahab. Mm -hmm. And he assumes that the reader knows who these people are. doesn't take time to explain their place in the story. He's just like, yeah, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, Abraham. Uh, Now I, I said in my sermon, uh, that I grew up in a church where we sang a song, Father Abraham had many sons. And so uh, like Abraham is the father of the Jewish faith because he's called out of an area. God says, I'm going to do a new thing, start a new people. Uh, and Jesus comes from his line. So Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob. And so Abraham's the father of the Jewish faith, subsequently also the father of the Christian faith. And I kind of threw a little fun fact in there. Uh, his firstborn son, Ishmael, and through Ishmael's descendants comes Islam. Mm-hmm. And so Abraham's also the father of the Islamic faith. Um, anyway, this is, this is all couched. The gospel works and Christian life is all couched in the story of Israel. So uh, what he is saying, though, is that when, when God called Abraham and gave him this promise he was going to have a son and be the father of many nations, it, it made no sense at this point in Abraham's mm-hmm. life. Yet... Abraham didn't just believe God, he, his life showed through his actions. And so that's what James is saying is like, uh, the father of our faith 
is known because of what he did. Mm -hmm. And then he also brings up Rahab, who was a Gentile prostitute who lived in Jericho, who Mm -hmm. uh, later in the story of Israel hid the spies of Israel before they attacked Jericho and destroyed it. And she's mentioned in both of these people and others are mentioned in Matthew chapter one, the Mm -hmm. first page of the New Testament in the family tree of of Jesus. So it's like when when you first get to the story of Jesus in this Bible, it starts with who he's related to, how this story came to be. And Abraham's there, Rahab's there, and they are there, not because of just the things they knew or what they believed in their heart, but because of the way they lived their life. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yep. Fantastic. Anything yeah, to add? I that got was nothing great. to add. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> Very, really cool. Okay. So maybe if somebody has some extra time in their week, they could go back, look at those characters, read their stories, get to know those, and then it would make this even more yeah. rich, well, right? I mean, what I, what I hope people hear when we, I, had, I probably do this too much. I don't know if you can do it too much, but try to talk about the story of Israel and the whole, the mm-hmm. whole Bible is not feel intimidated mm-hmm. because it really is intimidating to get to know this. But when you spend year after year learning mm-hmm. little by little, you look up one day and you're like, oh, I, I actually have learned where all this fits mm-hmm. and how it all works together. And I mean, I've been in church and around the Bible my whole life, but every year that I read it, I see something new. For sure. So I hope people feel encouraged to stick with it, plot along. Mm-hmm. God is faithful to to show you things. Yeah, mm-hmm. fantastic. All right, so another way that we can look through this is systematic theology, right? So that's sort of a different perspective. Instead of uh, taking a step back and looking at the overarching story, then we sort of look with a microscope at doctrine. So are there any theological um, doctrines that you saw that are, are uh, highlighted here in this part? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the big uh, you know glaring one for those who study systematic theology would be just the doctrine of justification yeah. in here, and so uh, you know just throughout church history, I mean it's been um, uh, uh, a doctrine that's been uh, understood and fought over in different ways. I mean mm-hmm. this is a big part of the Reformation. Uh, you know Martin Luther had some things to say about the book of James just because of uh, how it could be misunderstood and what it was saying about justification. So just the idea that uh, you know his, you know James two twenty four that's that's the real sticky one. Uh, you know you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And uh, if you're familiar with the writings of Paul, uh, especially Romans 3.28, uh, R- Paul seems to say something that is the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. He says that we are not justified. Uh, let's see, what do you say? We are, we are justified by faith. Uh, you're going to have to help me with this exactly the word. He said, we are justified by faith. Lance brought a Bible. Don't I did. Worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my, my, yeah, mine just has James. Faith yeah. and not by works of the law. You want Romans right? 3.28? Yeah, Romans 3.28. Do you want to yeah. read it for us? Um, Romans. Your pastor voice again. Yeah. No, 3, 3.28. <laughs> yeah. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Yeah, apart from works of the law. And so, um, you know, this is... Uh, it's really just the, the understanding that justification, uh, being declared innocent before God, mm-hmm. uh, happens because of what Jesus has done for us and not by our works. And so that is uh, applied to us by faith in Jesus and not by us you know, trying to, to do the different works of the law. And so that's this point that Paul is making uh, over and over again. I mean, throughout Romans and all his other epistles, he's trying to help his readers understand that it is not by you uh, checking off religious mm-hmm. boxes and being able to fulfill these different works of the law to be justified or counted innocent before God. It's by faith and faith alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was that was a big point in the Reformation. That's what Martin Luther and Calvin, those those guys were really talking about. But then you get to James two twenty four, and it seems like it says the the opposite. A person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Um, and so uh, there, there's a lot of different ways or a lot of different parts of this passage that help us to see that James and Paul are not contradicting each other. Uh, one of them is you look at how they use the word justified. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think those who are preaching on this might go into this a little bit more in depth, but uh, James seems to be using the word justified differently mm-hmm. than Paul. Uh, so justified can be used in a couple of different ways. There's a couple of different definitions for it. One, the way that Paul uses it is to be de- be declared innocent before God. Uh, but James seems to use it in a different way, more like uh, to demonstrate or to be vindicated. And so we might say something like if somebody makes this claim that, hey, this thing is right, and you say, hey, would you like justify that statement, right? Mm-hmm. Like prove that that statement is, is true. Mm-hmm. Um, 
he kind of seems to be using it in the same way to demonstrate that, uh, that you are saved, to demonstrate that you actually have this faith by these works. So that's one way to, to look at this and see how these are, in fact, saying the same thing, maybe from a different angle. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way to look at it is James uses the word uh, not by faith alone. So, uh, and this kind of gets back to this whole point, is that faith is... A real faith is never alone. That real faith always has works as mm -hmm. a part of it, right? That's the whole point of the, the message, that real faith uh, is something that makes a real difference that you can really see. Uh, so there is no such thing as a real faith that is alone, right? Faith is mm -hmm. always going to have works as a, as a, um, as a demonstration of that, of that real faith. Uh, so James and Paul are not saying different things, that they, are, they would both affirm that we are justified by faith in Jesus, and that faith will actually be demonstrated with the works that show up in our lives. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Justification. 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 Yep. Yeah. You have anything to add there? Yeah. There's a sneaky little one. I don't, I'm, Ryan yeah. handled justification. There's a sneaky yeah. one in there that uh, it's, it, you can gloss over it real quick, but it's in verse 19. Uh, he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Mm -hmm. Even the demons believe and shudder. Uh, just the belief that God is one doesn't stand out as odd to us. But in, in this context, in the ancient world, I mean, everyone around them believed that there were all kinds of gods. Right. And every every village and every town would have had their own patron deity, their own mm -hmm. patron god. But then they had gods for every aspect of life. And if you lived your life and didn't worship the gods, if you're if you if you lived in Asia Minor, not if you were a Jew, um, then you really stood out. Right. And so he's actually he's He's commending these people saying, you have right belief, you have right understanding, but it hasn't affected the way you live. Even mm -hmm. the demons have this right understanding. God is one. There's one God, not many gods. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's, that's a little one that when you, when you learn the context of uh, the timing and who this was written to and what their life was like, just stands out. Like mm -hmm. we take for granted that, that belief in one God isn't normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and it's interesting to think about how James is, is probably has in mind, or he's referencing the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, 4, that says, you know, here are Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to talk about how, you know, we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart. So it's interesting to say the, de the demons believe that first part, like they mm -hmm. believe that God is one, but yeah. they have right. some right beliefs ar around God, but yet they... They don't actually have this real faith, right? That makes a real difference that you can really see because they haven't really embraced the, the following part after Deuteronomy uh, 6, 4 about the Lord is one. Uh, so they haven't really loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, uh, yeah, it's yeah. interesting to think about because I don't think people think about the, the belief or the faith, right? Because belief and faith are, are the same uh, Greek word. Um, that they, that the faith of demons, mm -hmm. right? What, what do they actually believe? Well, they actually believe a lot of things that maybe we struggle to really believe. Like they know God's powerful. They mm -hmm. know that he's the one that is in control. Uh, they, you know, they know that he's one, that he knows, they know that Jesus is the king and yet they don't submit, they don't love, they don't obey what God says. And so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, man, it's interesting. Demons. Yeah. yeah. Both of those points that you just made are... They seem, uh, I don't want to say simple because they're not, but like they're so profound yep. that it's, it can take me on a rabbit trail that I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy, right? So I also think I really appreciate that you brought up um, what seems on the surface like a contradiction is actually not, right? That's really helpful to hear too, because I think that's something that a lot of people encounter whenever they read James for themselves. And then if they've already you know, been familiar with the writings of Paul, they're like, wait a second, what? Right? So right. Yep. I appreciate the two different uses of justification. Very good. Awesome. Okay. So this is my favorite question of all of these, just because I love this behind the scene, uh, take a peek behind the curtain. So you, like I said, you have a really robust text. There's a lot of really great stuff in here. Is there anything that you had to cut that isn't going to make it in your message, but if you had, you know, endless time, if you could go on and on, you would really, you wish you could make a point or something that didn't make it in, but you really, you know, it was hard to cut. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is, this is always like the fun part in the podcast because you can just kind of go through from top to bottom and just mention off some things. So, I, I mean, I think about the whole section about uh, how we love and we care for the poor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there's this like hypothetical situation that is kind of close to reality. So it's really <laughs> not that hypothetical probably for his readers or for us today. And it's like, imagine this... 
a brother or sister. So this is a follower of Jesus who's cl- poorly clothed and uh, lacking in daily food. So they lack food and the lack or clothing and food. And then the person, instead of actually providing for that food or that clothing, they just say, be warmed, right? So be clothed and be filled with food. And, uh, and then they just go on their way and they feel pretty self-righteous and feel pretty good about mm-hmm. that. Uh, I think there's, I mean, you know, James is just using that as one illustration mm-hmm. where, man, your your faith is not showing up in your everyday interaction with people because mm-hmm. uh, you're coming across poor people on a daily basis um, and your faith is is just kind of like passing by people. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's just using it as an illustration, but it would be, you know, it'd be good to really think more about that. And so that's one thing that, you know, the sermon doesn't allow to mm-hmm. do a whole sermon on that, even though you very well could. Um I mean, all the stuff about demons stuff is interesting. Uh, when, when you get down to, I mean, this is just kind of nerdy language stuff Bring if, you're, it on. if you're into it. But on verse 20, verse 20 uh, do, you not, uh, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? I thought it was interesting how that word useless is, uh, is the word argos, which basically it, it's kind of the play on word of the word works because the oh, word works cool. is er, uh Ergos, ergon. Mm. So ergos and argos. So it's kind of saying like your your works is workless. It's useless. Uh, and so that, things like that are always interesting to me that, you know, James is just has a little, I mean, he's, he's preaching. It's what it is. That's what preacher <laughs> yeah. would do. It's yeah. like take a word and sort of like turn it a little bit and put uh-huh. it against each other. So your works are workless, yep. useless. Hmm. Anyway, what you got? Get any language? Oh, you got any Greek? You I, don't, Greek I don't have any Greek. <laughs> I, I, do, I do love when that's pointed out uh, because... So much of that is lost yeah. in translation. Yes. And I would say, I mean, I, I've that, taken Greek, but I've forgotten a lot of it. Yeah. And so things like that, you know, those are pointed out mm-hmm. like in commentaries. You're like, oh, okay. Oh. Like, that's interesting. Yeah. So I always like to say that that way when someone's reading like, well, I can, you know, I guess I got to like go to seminary and know Greek to know that. It's like, no, you know, read some commentaries. They'll point mm-hmm. some things out. And you're like, oh, that's interesting, you know, because it can't come out in English all the time. So yeah. they might just like point out little play on words of mm-hmm. things like that that are interesting, but not essential. Yep. Uh, the, for me, I love telling the story of the Bible. We've already talked about that. So man, I, it, I always have to push against the temptation to spend so much time like framing all of this, mm-hmm. uh, just because I, I want people to know the way this fits into the grand story. So I, I left a lot of that on the cutting room floor. Uh, the, what Ryan brought up about the interaction, uh, with, people who are different or, or people, sorry, people in need and someone's lip service. Gosh, mm-hmm. I wanted, I want to really hammer on that a little bit because I think that's something that is, it happens for us. Mm-hmm. Our faith sometimes is lip service, but not really active. Mm-hmm. And we're all, we're all guilty of that to some degree. So uh, then the other thing, uh, again, just for the listener, helping all of us examine ourselves. So what we know versus what we do, mm-hmm. it's just not enough time in a sermon to, oh, yeah. to point out. And we know these things, mm-hmm. but we're not doing these things and give all the, all the examples. Yeah. Uh, I could just give my own and mm-hmm. fill more time than a sermon has. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, I, and some of that too is when you think about a passage like this that feels really convicting and you're mm-hmm. trying to think through like, all right, where is this not really showing up in my life? There's always that, that balance that, um, on one hand, it's like, yeah, I mean, like th- this needs to show up in my life and mm-hmm. it's really not. But on the other hand, trying to, uh, think about the, the process of, of sanctification, mm-hmm. right? The process of growth. We've already talked about that in some of the previous uh, yeah. podcasts and messages. Uh, it's one that it takes a long time mm-hmm. and uh, God is patient and gracious with mm-hmm. us. And so, I mean, sometimes when we read a passage like that and we think, man, so does that mean I got to go out and like, you know, clothe and feed every mm-hmm. p- poor person that I possibly could could go find anywhere I go. And then and then that, that actually is just addressing one issue within our society. But then what about this other issue? Mm-hmm. What about this other issue? And then there's all these people and like, and so uh, there's like, there's that, uh, I don't want to say balance necessarily, but there is, there's a process of both, feeling this conviction and, and having uh, been changed and transformed mm-hmm. by the Holy Spirit working in us, but also knowing that, you know, this is, a, this is a process mm-hmm. and um, God is calling us to feel this conviction, to repent mm-hmm. and to believe the gospel and to allow it to really shape our lives. Mm-hmm. And he's just kind of nudging us along and we're, and we're growing more and more uh, day by day and um, to not feel super frustrated uh, whenever it's like, yeah, I, I don't look perfect. Well, yeah, you're, you're not going to be perfect. It's going to be until mm-hmm. you get to the end of Lance's Bible, not mine. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll see that. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. I think that's really helpful, especially because I, I do notice a lot of times like when a tragedy happens in, you know, society, the comments on it, like, you know, thoughts and prayers, thoughts, thoughts and prayers, and prayers yeah. thoughts yeah. and prayers. And so it's, it, it is convicting, but in a, in a good, healthy way, you know, we should do something about it. And also we're not the savior at the same time. And, you know, very good. Awesome. So how about, so practically we read this section, we hear this message, uh, faith without works is dead. That's already a, a big sentence. And so what do we do with that? How do we live with that? What does that look like practically? What do you hope that the listener, um, how, how do you hope they live differently because of this? So I, I'll start with, I think because this passage is so challenging and convicting, anyone can sit down and read it. And whether you know the story of the Bible or not, whether a, a preacher is explaining the Greek or not, mm -hmm. you feel the weight of it. Mm -hmm. Because you, instantly what comes to mind are places in your own life where you know your faith hasn't shown up or you haven't lived the way God wants you to. It's, it's immediately evident. And so... Uh, one thing that I, I hope people take away is uh, that we're not meant to feel the crushing weight of shame and guilt with this. Mm -hmm. We should feel conviction. We should feel challenged, but we need the hope of Jesus. And so practically at its base level, we need to be reminded that God's mercies are new every morning, mm -hmm. that, uh, that Jesus offers as the New Testament says, grace upon grace. Mm -hmm. And so wherever you feel conviction and challenge, uh, don't, don't sit and wallow in mm -hmm. shame, but instead uh, take a deep breath, mm -hmm. rest in grace, and then start moving forward with living out your faith. And so I think that's what we can talk about next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as far as like practical things go, I mean, we, we've, we, we titled this message, Real Faith, We've had the series Real Faith mm -hmm. because really this section is is really you know the, the main part yep. of what James is kind of known for as a book, and it's the heart of of whatever what this whole series the whole book is mm -hmm. really about. And so I would say if there's anything practical, it's to take what we're talking about in this passage and to look for all the different practical examples that you see throughout the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean you know he talks about taming the tongue in the very next mm -hmm. chapter. I mean. Uh, you know, wisdom. We've talked about trials, um, uh, rich and poor. Last week, you know, we had uh, talked about partiality. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different practical ways mm -hmm. this might show up. Where does, where does my faith need to actually start to, you know, manifest itself and be demonstrated in my life? Well, James gives us plenty of different places to get started on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it looks like, you know, your faith impacting how you work impacting how you relate to your spouse or your kids or your neighbors. Um, I mean, you know, he gives some examples here. Um, you know, one of the things that I was trying to think through in this passage, and I'm not making the many preaching points in here, but how, well, you see in this first example that James gives about the poor people, uh, that how you can respond to them is how uh, God is calling us or showing us how we are, should uh, love people. Mm -hmm. Uh or no, what, what did I say? These were going to be some good preaching points, but I ended up cutting them. Um, let's see. Uh, to, here we go. It was going to be share God's love. Mm -hmm. uh, then it was going to be obey God's word because it's referencing Abraham. And then to uh, join God's mission because mm -hmm. Rahab is essentially, mm -hmm. she's identifying herself with what God is doing in, right. in Jericho. She's saying, I want to be on God's mission, his purposes. So... Mm -hmm. Those are some preaching points that got cut there. But yeah. um, I mean, I think if, if you think through, okay, how does that look like in my life to uh, to share God's love with those around me, whether it's poor people or it's some of my neighbors or people who are in my life, what does it look like to obey God's word? And so how am I searching through the scriptures to see, are there different things that the Holy Spirit's just bringing into mind that you know mm -hmm. I ought to, to think about? What does it look like to obey in, in my uh, in my life, and then also to join God's mission, to be a part of what God's doing in the world, and to share uh, the good news of the gospel with people around us. So um, mm -hmm. maybe those are some ways to help give people some categories to help narrow down what it practically looks like in their life. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, in my sermon, I, I uh, leaned on a graphic I created years ago. So I'm thankful for my time in student ministry because my job was. Uh, junior high. Mm -hmm. So I spent many years trying to explain the Bible and the gospel and applying it to kids that are, you know, 
in some really challenging years. Sure. So um, years ago when I taught this same text to junior high kids, I, I used a whiteboard and I just drew like a man or, or like a kid. And I said, like, we have just different categories and buckets in our life. And so you're a student and you're an athlete and you're a child. And, you, you know, we have all these um, areas of our life. Faith itself is, is a thing in our life for most people. Like you, you, you don't have faith and then one day you suddenly do. And so it's, it's part of your life. And there's this temptation for us to just keep it as a part of our life Mm -hmm. because we go to a church an hour a week or maybe a couple or a few hours a week. We're involved in the life of the church or with God's people. And it just kind of stays as part of our life. But what James is arguing is that faith is not meant to just be part of your life. That really the whole message of the New Testament is you're a new creation and now you are, your faith should infect every other part of your life. Mm-hmm. That you are now new in Christ and you live in Christ so that as a student or as a child or what I said on Wednesday night was uh, like as a family member, as an employee or an employer, uh, it, your role in the community, the way you engage in politics, like your faith should show up in every mm-hmm. place. It's not just a piece of you. It's really faith works its way everywhere. Mm-hmm. So um, I, practically speaking, that's the question before us. It's like, what part of my life has my faith not affected? Mm-hmm. What part of my life am I holding on to? I say like, yeah, I'll, I'll change the way I behave in those places, but not here. I think James would argue you've got some work to do. Mm. So uh, I, I thought of, and I, you know, I thought about telling this, but I didn't. This is one of the things I left on the cutting room floor. Uh, in my small group, we're reading through the whole Bible. And one of the guys, Tyler, has just like, the Bible's coming alive for him in a mm-hmm. new way. And he, he was telling us, uh, he's like, man, I, I just can't get enough. I'm thinking now, I'm not just like reading and listening to the Bible, but I find myself at work thinking about God's word <laughs> and thinking about how like my conversations with the people that work for me are different. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, that's it. Mm-hmm. When, when your faith comes alive at work and when it <laughs> wasn't before, mm-hmm. that's what we're talking about. Like that is faith and works. It's not a, a to-do list. I'm supposed to go now clothe the poor and feed the hungry while we should do those things. It's really... Faith alive everywhere. So mm-hmm. uh, when I read Psalm 1 recently, I thought of Tyler and I thought of all this. It said, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. And so it's like, this is a picture of someone connected, their faith is real and alive. It's like a tree by a stream of water, just living and beautiful. And so anyway. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, what I hear you saying is that we should be fully devoted followers. Yeah, <laughs> I've See, heard that I before. I don't know yeah. why we did, yeah. did the podcast. We yeah. didn't just yeah. say that in the beginning. <laughs> that was the answer. That was it. Yeah. All right, so let's wrap up with this. Uh, as you were studying yourself, this section, was there any um, verses or ideas that were really convicting to you personally? Uh, so we talked about how we can all apply it. Um, but what about you? Is there anything that stood out to you that that you want to kind of live differently because of? Uh, you got something? Yeah. I, it was really, it started during the study and preparation, but it was really a, the hour leading up to preaching. And so I've, I've already preached this sermon because we did it Wednesday night, but um, God's patience with me mm. was just really evident because I, Man, I'm I'm as challenged and convicted by this as anyone else. Uh, that I need my faith to change parts of my life mm-hmm. that I haven't let it right. Uh, and before the sermon, we sang a song like "My heart is prone to wander." Lord, I feel it. Like man, all all that was real because we were uh, rehearsing all that before the service. So I was just struck by God's patience with me. Why does He still, again and again, give me grace mm-hmm. and show me patience? Uh, but that's who he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so while I was challenged definitely to live, I, I'm just moved by his his love and patience. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always really good stuff. Uh, I mean, I would say uh, definitely the part about um, how you treat and how you love uh, the poor is always helpful to, to be reminded of and feel convicted over because it's easy to just... 
Uh, it's it's easy to, to put things like that in a category of being willing to do something versus mm-hmm. actually do something. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's like the read the passage about the uh, the the rich young ruler who gives up everything to follow Jesus, or is mm-hmm. called to give up everyone to follow Jesus. We actually don't know uh, how he responds. Well, we know how he responds. He goes away sorrowful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we assume he he that's a that's a no. Um, So we usually read passages like that and we say, okay, well, God's not actually calling any of us to go do that. He's just saying, be willing to, be willing to, Mm -hmm. okay, okay, I'm willing to. Well, it's Mm -hmm. much easier to say you're willing to do that than to actually do it. Mm -hmm. And not to say that he is necessarily calling everyone to go do those things, um, but it's really easy just to put those in the be willing to category, right. you know, and then even looking at the example of Abraham with Isaac. Okay, I just need to be willing to mm. follow God, even if it doesn't make sense to me, even if it sounds like kind of crazy and it kind of sounds mm-hmm. like, uh, is is God like telling me to do something like mm-hmm. that is crazy, um, like sacrifice my own child? Mm-hmm. Um but I'm just going to be willing. I'm saying I'm going to be willing to do those things, uh, hypothetically, if God was to ask me to do that. Um, but then to actually like, it, is God really calling you to do that? You know, honestly asking yourself those questions and not just quickly put it in that willing to bucket. Uh, but then also, are you really willing to do that? So uh, I just try to really think through a lot of that um, as, I was, as I was going through this, especially the whole part about, you know, what demons believe versus do they really obey God and submit to him and love him? Um, now, how easy is it to say, yeah, yeah, God is one. Yeah, I believe all mm-hmm. those things, right? I mean, I know a whole bunch of facts, but yet not really live submitted um, in obedience to God uh, out of love and adoration. Uh, and so uh, just trying to think through, how has that really shown up in my life? Am, am, I, am I really, am I, is my belief or is my faith no different than a demon's in this mm-hmm. area of my life mm-hmm. where I say the right things, but I don't actually do anything that shapes my life? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Just trying to work through all that. Yeah. yeah. Everybody else's. I mean, God still calls people to do crazy things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, all the time. So it's more than just being willing. It's listening to the voice of God and saying, yes, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do that crazy thing you're calling me to do. I, you know, whatever that might be. Yep. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Very good. Well, this was super great. So uh, your salvation, does it depend on your works, but your works are evidence of it and be convicted, but there is no condemnation in for those of us that are in Christ. So anything else you want to add to that? Nope. Good? <laughs> That's cool. great. We're good. This James said everything. So, yeah, <laughs> he did a great job. Yep. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to the next one. All right. Hey, thanks for checking out this video. If you haven't yet, make sure that you hit subscribe down below and check out clearcreekresources.org. We have videos, books, and sermons on there, as well as our audio podcast. Thanks for watching.